and welcoming George Baird for his second lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I, I, as Dennis pointed out, this is um, the second lecture in a series, um, but um, they're interrelated. And so in that regard, can I have a show of hands of how many of you who are here tonight weren't here on Monday? People at the back were here Monday, but no, I see one hand. Okay, that's sorry, that's about. I think, given that, I think it might, uh, given that these are interrelated and that, notwithstanding Dennis's compliments about my uh, supposed ability to uh, relate practice and theory, um, this, this set of presentations is very theoretical. Um, I'm not happy about that. Blame it on Dean Al Curry because he made me do it. Um, it was not my choice of topic, but it was his choice of topic. So there we are. Um, actually, I've been told to stick close to the mic. I shall try to do so. Um, so what I think I'm going to do to start with is do a very short um, summary of Monday because because uh, I think tonight will make the the main part of the presentation tonight will make more sense if, for those of you who weren't here Monday if, if I do that. Um, I, got, I got interested in the debate about public space, you know, a decade and a half ago or thereabouts, and I was, I, I was taken aback that there was such a kind of sharp polemical bifurcation um, between a group of people who um, were arguing in favor of a, a what I thought was a problematically historicist kind of vision of urban, uh, public space in our time that I mentioned the Creer Brothers as a couple of instances of, um, of interesting, uh, they're clearly interesting designers, but with a, uh, a kind of hopelessly um, historicist kind of perspective. I mean, um, uh, um, Rob has done better than Leon at actually getting buildings executed, but neither of them has had an extensive career, and I think it's in large measure because of their um, stubborn insistence on a kind of historical perspective on architecture and urbanism, um, which is just unimplementable in the modern world. So that troubled me on the one hand. Then at the other extreme, uh, there was a group of people I t refer to as the uh, a left intelligentsia in architectural theory um, that were making an argument that you know public space was so degraded that basically it wasn't even worth bothering to think about any longer. And I cited names like um, Michael Sorkin, Mike Davis. Um, there was a, not um, a notorious book by Aaron Betsky called No More Flowers, colon, Against Public Space. Um, what an extraordinary uh, title for a, an architecture book. So, so this um, polarization, polemical polarization, struck me as a bad idea, um, and, uh, and actually an inappropriate idea, because it was perfectly clear to me that w while um, there were problems with public space in our time, and nobody's denying that, certainly not me, um, it seemed to me that, that um, that one could, one could get at this issue more constructively and more tactically um, by other routes than the ones which these two opposed uh, ideological camps were proposing. Um, and so th that, was my, that was my objective with this um, investigation. Um, I've, be, I've been interested, uh, one, of my, one of my earlier books, um, actually, I'm, let me go backwards. This is what you didn't see on Monday in reverse. This is the street photography. Um, but I'm, I'm just wanting to go back to uh, the beginning to show you the book. Now 
nice pictures for those of you that didn't see them. Interesting pictures. These are the street photographs, which were the vehicle I used to try to demonstrate what I'm about to talk about to you. Okay, this is the book um, that came out of this, Cultural Political Theory, Public Space, Cultural Political Theory, Street Photography. So I, I've already explained to you the kind of debate into which I propose to insert myself. Um, and the, 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 the theoretical backdrop that I wanted to use, which is what the second subtitle refers to, is, was, had to do with the fact that I've been interested for a long time in political theory, and in particular, the political theory of a German-American uh, philosopher called Hannah Arendt, um, and most, uh, as most explicitly said of in her book, The Human Condition. And, um, and I picked up um, Arendt was very interested in et et etymological constructs, and there are, uh, there's two sets of terms which are kind of fundamental to her theorizing. One is the binary opposition between public and private, and, this, and the second one is a kind of triad, which is, in her mind, uh, hierarchical, stretching from labor to work to action. Um, and I've, I've, I've actually written in, in a previous book called The Space of Appearance, which is actually a, a quotation from Arendt, um, I've um, uh, elaborated those ideas further. But I use them again in my theoretical introduction to this material um, in order to um, try to frame a new perspective on public space, which would not start from formal questions about how public space is configured, uh, but from these more conceptual questions as, as to what it is to, to, uh, to you know, what the com public actually comprises as a political category. Um, so Arendt was important to, to, for me. Jürgen Habermas, whom she actually influenced, um, primarily through his n notable book called the, the, public, the Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, was a second figure. And then thirdly, and this is where the cultural theory comes in, thirdly, I relied on um, uh, a concept from the, the work of Walter Benjamin, um, uh, and, and respect of which I actually, I can sort of capture this in a quotation. Um, um, uh, Benjamin is famous in architectural circles for having um, made the statement, architecture is the prototype of a work of art which is appropriated by a collectivity in a state of distraction. Um, so basically I took from that panoply of three um, theorists the uh, three terms, action from Arendt, well, one to two terms, excuse me, action from Arendt and distraction from Benjamin, even though they're not in their own theory, in their respective theorizing, they're not interrelated. It was me who took the initiative of juxtaposing them. Um, and I, I, I made the argument that um, you could actually see, it would be possible to see a spectrum of human praxis in public spanning from distraction to action, um, and by that mechanism to sort of capture something of the essence of what publicness actually comprises. And of course, that's what my street photographs represent. This is Robert Frank in, the, in 1956 in New Orleans, a distracted public in my opinion, uh, the Bronx in New York in the 80s, another distracted public. Um, this is all of something which is not fully distracted. Um, uh, persons in the street actually starting to pay attention to something extra as extraordinary as a guy holding a pair of snakes in his hands. Um, this is an older person um, rather attentively studying and maybe not entirely fr in a fr entirely friendly fashion studying a younger one. Um, this is two businessmen in the street in Chicago actually starting to con uh, converse. It's the first speech that occurs in my sequence. Speech is a fundamental 
construct of action for Arendt. Um, this is sheer sociability as represented by the work of the Korean American uh, photographer Nikki Lee. Um, and now for the first time, this is a photograph of Danny Lyon from the 60s, the civil rights co conflicts in the American South, um, um, an altercation in the street between a, an SNCC worker and a local person who would prefer that he minded his own business. Um, the erotic dimension of the public making its ma self manifest for the first time in my sequence. The performative dimension of the public making itself present in my sequence. The collective dimension of the public making itself present. The collective combined with the performative. Um, and then um, in, uh, in the two images which are the sort of pivot of this sequence for me, this is uh, Walk Walker Evans in the 1930s, um, you know, uh, um, a political agitator um, um, speaking urgently to his peers, uh, uh, looking for political support for uh, an activity. Um, and then the con a contemporary version of the same thing from London, England, with a young woman representing the Salvation Army. Um, and then, of course, we have the performative uh, the performative uh, combined with the parade in the form of a political protest to act up in San Francisco. Um, and then, of course, for the first time, uh, the action portrayed is, as I'm, I'm, this is an ascending sequence of intensity from distraction at one end to action at the other. And at this point, you know, phys bodily intervention actually takes place for the first time. Um, uh, but here it's largely performative as opposed to actually threatening. In this case, it's a different matter, another protest march, but here, of course, it's not performed. This is actually real danger and real menace. Um, and then a uh, famous archival photograph on, by an unknown photographer. This is young men in Berlin, East Berlin, in 1953, participating in the first rebellion against the Obrich communist government of East Germany, the first rebellion against um, Soviet uh, domination in Eastern Europe that took place in Europe, 53. Um, and then, of course, a, a famous example. Not everything I did was street photography. This is a, a newsreel clip, of course, of the the extraordinary events in Tiananmen Square. And then I ended, just to defuse the tension of that uh, strongly political climax to my sequence, I ended it with this photograph of the German photographer Thomas Struth of a contemporary urban street scene in the, the Chinese city of Wuhan. So that was, that was um, um, how I tried to, um, Having set out the political, political theoretical framework that I described a moment ago, how I um, uh, attempted to kind of portray the spectrum of uh, public experience from distraction to action uh, via the means of street photography. Okay, which then brings us to tonight when I promised that I would talk about the architectural conditions of publicness. So here we go. This is, of course, the Paris Opera. And I'm going to start with a quotation from the author, or sorry, the architect of the Paris Opera, Charles Garnier. Here we go. No one used to think that apart from the spectacle of the plays enacted, the view of broad staircases crowded with people was a spectacle of pomp and elegance too. But today, luxury is spreading this is, by the way, this is dated 1878. Um, today, luxury is spreading, comfort is demanded everywhere, and there are those who love to see the movement of a varied and elegant crowd who follow the emptying of a great theater with interest. The eyes, as well as the mind, bid for the satisfaction and pleasure. It all imposes on the architect uh, broad and monumental arrangements with vast and commodious stairways. 
There will be profit and advantage for everyone, therefore, if the big central stairway is a place of luxury and movement, if ornament is distributed elegantly, if the animation that rules the steps is an interesting and varied spectacle. With the lateral walls of the staircase arranged to be left open, um, all the people walking about on each floor will be able to, to will be able uh, will as they like be able to entertain themselves by the view of the great hall um, and by the incessant comings and goings of the crowd up and down the stairs. So that's the, um, the one of two quotations with which I kick off this um, part of my presentation. Um, and now here is the second one. I don't have an image to go with the second one. I think you'll understand in a moment why I couldn't find one to go with this. This is a passage from uh, uh, a personal memoir written in 1956 by uh, an African-American activist called Claude Brown um, and in, from a book called Man Child in the Promised Land. <clears throat> it was Sunday morning. Kids were coming from church with their mothers and fathers, and some people were sick and vomiting on the street. Most of the people were dressed up, and vomit was all over the street near the beer gardens. There was a lot of blood near the beer gardens and all over the sidewalk on 8th Avenue. This was a real Sunday morning, a lot of blood and vomit everywhere, and people all dressed up and going to church. Some of them were all dressed up and sleeping on the sidewalk or sleeping on building stoops. It was all real good to see again, real good. There were the ladies going to church in white dresses and trying real hard not to look at the men standing on the corners cussing and saying fresh things to them, but trying real hard to listen to what the men were saying without looking as though they were hearing it. The man who was all dressed up and sleeping on the sidewalk propped up against the newspaper stand uh, with a smile on his face sure looked happy. I was so happy to see them, to see it, to see it all, to see Harlem again. So those are my two passages with which um, uh, I kick this off. Bear with me while I read a little bit more of my text here. On the face of it, the social situations the two passages depict could hardly be more different. Yet is it not remarkable how richly they both epitomize the themes of publicness discussed um, in, in the sequence I've just gone through with you? Both accounts are grounded in the palpable human condition of sociability and in the compelling presence of the other. But powerfully evident in both descriptions as well are those multifarious specific conditions of social life so evident in the street photographs I have just shown you. Some of these are plurality, eroticism, a variety of modalities of public decorum, and then as another bonus, even the ample possibility for the protagonists of these narratives to exploit what I have called the ostensible rationale that is why you can get away with doing things in public where there are a lot of other people around that you could otherwise not do simply because it gives you pretexts for accostations and so forth, which in more conventional circumstances would not be possible. At first reading, Garnier's socialites savor the movement of an elegant and varied crowd, while Brown revels in the intense panorama of a Harlem Sunday morning street scene. Beyond this, the Parisians can be seen to entertain themselves by the incessant comings and goings of the crowd, while the New Yorkers try real hard not to look at the men standing on the no street corners, yet at the same time to listen to what the men were saying without looking as though they were hearing it. In short, we see here compellingly dramatized Hannah Arendt's conception of the space, what I called the, the title of my previous book, the space of appearance where I appear to others as they appear to me, the embodiment of publicness as envisaged in the most insightful political theory of the previous century. 
But the significance of the two passages is not limited only to such a general theoretical conclusion as this. They also make clear how fundamental to publicness the particular architectural, con architectural condition of visibility is. Indeed, it is my view that visibility constitutes one of the three basic architectural conditions of publicness. And now I think I, I don't know how I'm just work through the images. This, um, it's just in like a, a sort of scattershot kind of sequence through some kind of sort of major architectural moments where I kind of are, try to articulate various modalities of what I've described, just described as um, the architectural uh, visibility as, an, as an one of three fundamental architectural conditions of publicness. This is uh, Hannes Meyer's and uh, uh, Hans Witzger's famous uh, entry to the League of Nations competition in Geneva in 1927. Um, they didn't win, the, the famous scheme of Le Corbusier didn't win either. Um, but I'm, I'm showing this because um, uh, Meyer and Witzwer were kind of sort of political radicals at the time. And um, uh, they actually um, associated the transparency. They, they relied heavily on glass um, in this um, design. And the glass had a sort of po particular political significance for them. Uh, let me quote. No back doors for, black, for back stairs dip diplomacy, but open glazed rooms for the public negotiations of honest men. So they actually thought that the fact that the building embodied such a high degree of transparency um, held the possibility to um, generate a more open um, and um, genuine um, political praxis. Uh, I hope that turned out to be naive, as it turned out, but, it, but still, I think it's consequential for my purposes that two designers of such consequence as Meyer and Witzer actually held such a naive belief, um, if only a, a, at a period like 1927. Uh, so even if positive materi positivist materialism, which was the philosophical stance I'm ascribing to Meyer. Positivist materialism's quest for absolute transparency turned out to be futile. It is also true that architecture, like political theory, has learned in the intervening years the important potential of a more phenomenological condition of visibility in architecture, having to do with the relationship of distraction, which I've already talked about, and focality. Even if there is no transparency without shadows, we now also know that focused attention is a variable condition of consciousness. This surely is one of the most significant consequences of the hybriding of the concepts of action and distraction that I've just presented to you. Given these realities, we now have the possibility to imagine a more modulated model of the relation of consciousness to transparency than was available to the architects of the so-called heroic period back in the 20s. So with that, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, um, an argument which was put forward by um, a German colleague, uh, the ar architectural historian Fritz Neumeier, who's um, um, one of the most interesting interpreters of the... Neumeier was the first person to actually, in, in my experience at least, to point out that Mies van der Rohe, who for a long time had the tradition of being the architect who just built things, he didn't talk a lot and theorize or write books, he just built. Uh, well, Neumeier pointed out that Mies, he may not have written books, but he did think a lot, and he was a serious intellectual, um, and of course, one of, the thi one of the historical figures he was deeply interested in was uh, Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Um, uh, these are, this is a pair of illustrations, Schinkel at the top, Mies van der Rohe at the bottom that come from Neumeier's book in which, um, which Neumeier uses to epitomize um, the concept which he ascribes to Mies, which he calls, quote, the viewing frame. So in effect, the, the purpose of the architecture is actually to cause you 
to look at some human praxis in a kind of sort of more attentive way um, simply on account of the fact that the architecture frames it so explicitly. So he obviously sees the, the pergola in the Shinko um, uh, villa um, and the, um, the, the combination of the, the mullions and the, um, and the roof structure doing so in the National Gallery as kind of analogous uh, versions of the view of the pergola he's talking about. Um, I actually um, extrapolated this. This is um, the, the banking pavilion, the main banking pavilion of the Toronto Dominion Bank headquarters building in Toronto. Um, uh, uh, the, one of the, actually la one of the last projects uh, uh, Mies uh, designed before his death, um, finished in the middle 60s. Um, and here I think it's quite interesting. You can see through, uh, through the, the facade of the, the banking pavilion, you're, now you're inside looking out, um, you actually see the, the quotidian facade of the historical city on the oppo opposite side of the seat, uh, street captured within the viewing frame formed by the, the structural module of the, um, the, the enclosing colonnade um, uh, you know, around the space of, of the banking pavilion. The, the scene across the street has, of course, since disappeared on account of um, further redevelopment in downtown Toronto, but um, I thought this um, photograph you know, captured the moment of reality uh, as of the completion of the Mies project very effectively. Um, there are, of course, other modalities of visibility. <coughs> and of course, the, the phenomenon of the panoptic, the notorious phenomenon of the panopticon has its own kind of problematic uh, status in architectural history. Um, you know, started going all the way back to Jeremy Bentham. Um, and uh, to be frank, I was kind of surprised that someone as sophisticated as James Sterling would have used it in his scheme for the Cambridge History Faculty Library in England. But here you have it. Here is the, the librarian's desk. Those are the stacks. And supposedly he or she is supposed to see if anybody all through this whole arc is attempting to steal any books. The panopticon, indeed. Um, now here, these are actually. This is a this is a, an analog of a kind of what I, as opposed to panoptic vision, which is a, is of course a device of control. Um, I wanted to try to kind of capture what you might call heteroclite visibility, um, and I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't. Had, I was unsuccessful at finding, a, 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 a capturing um, heteroclite visibility in an in, in actual image. And so I've had to use the analog here of, um, of bodily movement in space as opposed to vision per se. Um, these are actually photographs from uh, Jose Luis Sert's um, um, book on the, the meeting of Sion on the heart of the city, which I think is 1952, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's, it's groups of people in the Piazza San Marco configuring and reconfiguring themselves according to the kind of circumstances of their conversation um, and their um, um, you know, proximate curiosity. Um, so it, it, it's not quite visibility, but it does actually cap capture heterogeneity in an effective way, in, 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 my, in my view. Um, and then here again, this is a, p a pair of images from, uh, well, this is from William White's Sociological Observations of People on the Streets of Manhattan in his uh, famous books from the 60s, which actually eventually had such a big impact on um, um, our approach to urban design in the city. So I mean, here again, you're actually kind of, uh, uh, I mean, White became famous, of course, for his ability to kind of portray exactly how it was that persons and bodies, um, you know, configured themselves collectively in the space of the city. Um, and interestingly enough, um, uh, a figure uh, with a lot in common with White from our own period, these are images from 
Uh, the Danish uh, architect and you know, enormously influential figure, Jan Gale, um, um, actually representing um, uh, episodes going on in, in different historical periods in his home city of Copenhagen, uh, where you get the same um, capturing of the um, you know, you know, heterogeneous experience of persons of faith. Now we come to my second construct, or my second condition of publicness, I should say, and that is propinquity. <clears throat> uh, and again, let me um, uh, read a passage. Is it not striking, looking again at this group of images, how subtly the patterns of human connection that are manifest there combine fluidity and constancy. Numbers and combinations and, uh, of numbers of individuals are constantly shifting, yet groupings of them do consistently form, and the degrees of dispersal and of concentration of groups that are the result are both relatively limited. In itself, this is suggestive of the significance of propinquity as a condition of publicness, that this is so has been acknowledged by even such an ostensible outsider as the well-known flaneur, a uh, name described by Charles Baudelaire in the 19th century. So here, this is a brief quote from Baudelaire. For the perfect flaneur, for the passionate spectator, it is an immense joy to set up in the heart of the multitude amid the ebb and flow of movement in the midst of the fugitive and the infinite. It is to be away from home and yet to feel oneself everywhere at home, to see the world, to be at the center of the world, and yet to remain hidden from the world. Such are a few of the pleasures of those independent, passionate, impartial natures which the tongue can but clumsily define. Even in circumstances where the spectator out in public seeks consciously to preserve his anonymity rather than to engage in the formation of sociability, propinquity therefore plays a key role. It is my view that this fundamental condition, propinquity, itself manifests several social characteristics that are pertinent to my ongoing argument. First of all is the purely mathematical consideration of sheer measure or distance. Let us begin our consideration of this condition by looking at the phenomenon of social distance in some detail. On the face of it, the relationship of distance to sociability would seem not to be straightforward. <clears throat> it, it can be the case that modest propinquity, that is to say a distance of some meters, can in fact be sociable. That having been said in, in figure 3-6, Danny Lyons Atlanta street scene, that's the one I showed you a few moments ago of the woman uh, berating the young man. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, intense in we witness intense social hostility, and this hostility is as close dimensionally as a, stri as a striking distance from one protagonist to the other. This suggests that there is no simple correlation to be found between the degrees of sociability and degrees of proximity in this complex matter of propinquity. <clears throat> All the same, any quick perusal of a broad range of the photographic material I have cited thus far suggests that some definable proximate distance, that some definable proximate range of social distance does seem to be operative. The Piazza del Duomo images those are the ones of the, the, the groups of people uh, reconfiguring themselves sequentially on, on the square at uh, San Marco um, alone suffices to demonstrate this much. Now, um, but of course propinquity is a kind of complicated phenomenon and that's what brings me to the image which is on the screen at the moment which is, I'm sorry, it's a poor photograph, but I had, I had to take it off the dust jacket of this book by this American um, sociologist called Lynn Laughlin. 
it's a remarkable picture of people at a soda fountain counter, and it's kind of, it's kind of intriguingly relevant for my propinquity discussion because it shows how if, if you're on your own and you go into a, 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 a diner like this one and you want to sit down at the counter, um, etiquette suggests that you leave a seat between yourself and the next person. It would clearly be disconcerting to someone already sitting there if you were to take a stool immediately next to them. Unless, of course, the, the, the sequence of stools was sufficiently occupied already that there were only stools in between seat, already seated individuals remaining available to be taken. So, uh, so there's a kind of, you can see how intriguing the kind of, you know, the, the relationship in terms of pr propinquity is between the availability of spaces and the proper distance between oneself and another person that actually pertains in social space. It's a, I, you, you can also use the analogy of the crowded subway car. P people are not as taken aback by you pushing right up against them in a crowded streetcar or, or subway car as they would be if you did the same to them, thing to them in an open street where it would actually be construed to be a frustration. <clears throat> so there are interesting nuances to the, the, the question of propinquity in public, um, <clears throat> which uh, um, frame this spe uh, specifically. <clears throat> now I want to turn to um, uh, Um, the, the, the phenomenon I call periphery and center. This is a, a 19th century hotel porch. You've probably seen such before. Um, and I do think that this is, um, um, it's, it's kind of sort of fascinating uh, public space. <clears throat> uh, let me quote again. Uh, well, actually, let me read again. This, this 19th century image depicts a grand public porch of that era, um, an expansive public floor in a space with a high ceiling. It produces a surprisingly varied set of localities within its overall configuration. To the right is the front facade of the institution to which the porch is an extension, in this case, presumably a hotel. To the left is the outer edge of the porch, offering a view of a space following Neumeyer we may even say a view of a potential world beyond. The space of the porch offers to its occupants a host of distinct social and psychological options of location. Uh, if alone, one may choose to hang back along the rear wall, as some of the people in the photograph are doing, or the, the, uh, the lithograph, I should say. Um, or if one is in a more confident frame of mind, one may venture forward to the outer edge. If in company, one has the same options. But in this case, one has to open oneself to an additional possibility. To moving outwards into the center, one may focus attention on one's companions or alternatively in concert with one's companions on the world beyond. In its combination of tectonic simplicity and social fluidity, the porch has come to be seen as a key example of, of a phenomenological condition in architecture that the late Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck famously named, quote, an in-between realm, end of quote. Not quite interior, not quite exterior, not fully exposing or declaratory of public intention, yet forward enough not to be reclusive. The in-between realm became for Van Eyck the quintessence of a valuable architecture in its capacity to, to span from the sheltering, recessive locus of the periphery all the way to a declaratory, performative, perhaps even heroic, visible center. It, it performs a similar role in my own argument. And then this leads me in turn to the phenomenon of overlook, which I talked about a little bit on Monday. Uh, this is a, a crude plan of Rockefeller Center. 
where you see Fifth, Fifth Avenue at the bottom, Sixth Avenue at the top. Uh, two of, I'm told the streets aren't loaded with, oh, yes, they are. Uh, going to the, the site stretches from 48th Street to 51st, uh, 49th and 50th cutting through the block. It's, it's interesting here, I've just been downtown in Miami preparing. I'm at, in sequence three of this uh, triple presentation, I'm doing a walking tour with students on Friday afternoon. And I chose as my, uh, without knowing a lot about Miami, I had to go by my hunches. Um, Liz Flatter Zyberg asked me, what, 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 what in Miami did I want to choose as the locus of my walking tour? So I said, I think I'm going to ask them to walk with me, first of all, in old downtown Miami, and then we'll cross the river into new downtown Miami, and we will ponder uh, the differences in the kind of character of public space between the one and the other. Um, so in that regard, for me, it's kind of in interesting to think about Rockefeller Center again, because of course this is a, a major redevelopment, the most important redevelopment in Manhattan in the, in the 1930s. There was nothing bigger or more extensive built in Manhattan than Rockefeller Center. And yet here, um, uh, all the existing streets continue to run through the, the complex and they remain as public as they ever were. In fact, uh, and then of course, not only are, are 50, 49th and 50th Street maintained, but um, a, a new street, which didn't even exist before, um, ex it cuts through the middle of both, all three blocks from 49th to 51st. Um, and, and alas, on account of terrorism paranoia in Manhattan, the cross street is no longer open to the public. But 49th and 50th still, even today, operate as perfectly normal public streets. So this could be considered, by the way, to be a little bit of a hint of the arrival in a few minutes of my third condition of publicness, which is continuity. Um, but I'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But for the moment, I, I want to use Rockefeller Center, and, the, and in particular, the plaza in front of the RCA building um, as my test case for um, overlook. So here are a couple of views of the famous space. And I think it's, it's well, you, first of all, you can see, you can see in both of these, uh, 49th Street with taxis and normal public life running through at the top of the image. And all, well, we can't, you don't, only, in the bottom one we see a little bit of uh, 50th, but not much. But we do, in both of them, we see the new cross street running across in front of the, uh, the RCA building. Um, and, in, 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 and of course, as of the date of the taking of these photographs, even it is still a fully public, normal piece of street. Um, but then what's interesting is that the, the um, at, as you can see in the, um, well, let's t take the top of the, as you, my pointer will, will be helpful to me here. is this planting. You can see, here's the, that's the street sidewalk here, the closer you move, that's the planter. You can see there's a set of steps down here, one, two, three, four, five, six steps. And that brings you down to this level. So that produces the, first of all, it demarcates, as the, even though the public sidewalk remains fully public, as you continue to move around the whole thing, um, slightly articulates the difference down to this level and also produces a condition of overlook look between this level and that level, which is, and of course, it's that magic thing, which is below the hip in terms of the human body, uh, which I think is very powerful in terms of overlook. Then if, if you're expecting people in public to go up and down steps, you're expecting to expect them to be relaxed. It makes a huge difference if the top of the flight of steps is above eye level. And there'll be five hour races after you go up the steps, which will then have to retrieve the, the upper surface on which you were eventually walking from the lower level. 
So they're not, they're not making quite such a cadre of effort to go out there with the unknown as they would be if they're not, if, if, if the requirement at the bottom of the ladder could be beyond that ladder, then they're still on the lower level. It's a kind of subtle and nuances that the law should bring into the equation. So, so you have a condition like that. Oops, sorry. So you have a condition like that here on both sides. And then, of course, from, from, the, from the lower level, then you have the even more dramatic condition of overlook down to the surface of the, in the wintertime, the skating rink, or in the summertime, the dining terrace um, at the bottom of, of the whole sequence. And then, of course, as you know, You know, one of the other great mysteries of delicious mysteries of Rockefeller Center is that this is a pedestrian promenade between buildings two and three that starts at street level, sidewalk level, coplanar at Fifth Avenue, and then gradually descends down until it brings you to the lower level at the, the, at the, the south edge of the plaza. So that's what you see. So, um, uh, I, I don't know of a better uh, of, uh, of an example of overlooks in a, a spatial organization which generates so many powerful and fascinating conditions of overlook as this one does. I mean, there are many others in the world. I'm not saying the Rockefeller Center is unique, but it, it concentrates uh, a, a, you know, a remarkable variety of conditions of public overlook um, in a relatively, and of course the whole area is, uh, is relatively small. Okay, now, as I said, I hinted already that, uh, that we, can we will conclude with my third um, architectural condition of publicness, which is continuity. <coughs> As with so many of the architectural um, conditions of publicness, it is my ambition to articulate in this text that continuity is in effect already implicit in the Rockefeller Center example I have just discussed. Um, the reason for this is that the regular street sidewalks that I have described as constituent components of the overall spatial order of the plaza are at the same time an integral component of the continuous public street grid of Midtown Manhattan. Serendipitous, distracted movement across this grid in any direction can bring one to this focal space. No conscious intention to enter the space is required. In other words, you don't have to plan to be there to find yourself there. That's another of the interesting dimensions of distraction. It just all of a sudden you're caught off guard to be in a situation of ability to see something that you didn't anticipate and you had no intention to actually plan to do. Such a condition of continuity, in my view, is as fundamental to publicness as our visibility and propinquity. In order to launch this discussion, we may take an, uh, yet another cue from the experts who are responsible for the marketing of space in shopping malls. In order to maximize the sales per square foot of retail space for the full extent of the space of any given mall, the designers will take great pains to ensure the easiest and most continuous flow of distracted shoppers through the entire circulation space of the mall in question. To do so, they will manipulate the levels of the parking structures abutting to such malls, uh, such malls if necessary, so that each and every level of the mall will seem to every shopper to be the main level. Uh, whichever entrance he or she uses to enter. The designers will also provide escalators at every possible location so as to make vertical ascent as thoughtless a distracted movement as, sim as simple forward perambulation for every shopper who moves through the mall's sequence of spaces. In respect of this crucial phenomenon of continuity, what makes a mall different from a typical piece of public urban territory is the perimeter boundary of the building. 
where the continuity I was describing comes to an abrupt end. Within an urban fabric that we can call truly public, um, no such abrupt end will ever occur. That is not to say that some parts of cities will not be more focal and more intense loci of public interest than other parts, but in all urban fabrics that successfully generate sociability, the gradations between precincts of greater and lesser focal intensity will be as subtle and as finely graduated as possible, just as they are in the streets and blocks around Rockefeller Center. And then I, I, I make reference here to the intriguing work. This is not my work, and it's not even my kind of work, um, but um, uh, a researcher called Bill Hillier and colleagues working with him at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, England, tried to undertake a, a kind of scientific, like literally scientific or mathematical version of the kind of continuity I'm talking about here. Here's, a, here's an example of a kind of precinct of uh, North London in Islington, where my wife and I used to live, not right here, but nearby. Um, and, there, and, and this is their kind of mathematical distillation of the pattern of perceptible roots in that neighborhood of Barnsbury. And then this is, these are some other examples of an analytical diagrams of theirs where they actually tried to capture the kind of intensity of kind of patterns. It's, it's kind of combination of visibility and movement and in, uh, incentive um, within a, an urban precinct and to try to you know, calculate its uh, you know, convert it into a kind of mathematical formula. To be frank, the mathematical formula is not of particular interest to me, but I do think the, 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 the methodological, the, the, the curiosity to actually come up with a method with which to do this um, is one that I share. Um, of course, this brings us to the phenomenon of the grid, the amazing um, uh, grid that we owe this to the British Army. I guess we owe it all around the whole world. We owe this to the British Army. The Yonaga people took it up. I hadn't realized, by the way, I've been, this is the longest I've ever spent in Miami. And um, I discovered you know, Miami and Toronto have in common a relationship between the big grid and the little grid. It's, um, I, I hadn't really appreciated until this visit the, the the extent of the power of the grid in, in Miami. In any event, this, this is um, uh, a generic railway grid. This is from John Rep's book, The Planning of Urban America. Um, uh, it, it doesn't even have a name. It's like, it's just plan of, and then you can fill in the blank. Um, um, and of course, it has the rail, railroad in the middle. Surprise, surprise, because it's the railroad is the land developer. Um, and then we get, you know, the streets go chestnut, walnut, hickory, mulberry in one direction and oak, locust, poplar, ash in the other. And then, and, you know, first north, first south, first, uh, second north, second south uh, in the opposite direction. So there's the, gen there's the generic grid for you. But of course, the grid, the grid is an amar a remarkable uh, phenomenon because it actually, um, produces uh, an extraordinarily high level of multilateral connectivity. Um, uh, and um, and it's, it's had a kind of sort of fascinating kind of um, mesmerizing power in the history of architecture ever since. I mean, you wouldn't have, um, these are two astonishing teams of 10 projects from the, from the 60s the middle 60s, well, early to middle 60s by Ken Dillis, Joseph and Woods, um, in which the grid was the kind of organizing principle which powerfully informed their design work. And um, this is, it's one of those kind of historical breakthroughs in architectural and urban design where um, uh, a whole generation kind of sort of flipped over between one kind of view of the, of the place of new buildings in an existing fabric and a new kind of view of what that would be like. So this is, this is a scheme to rebuild um, 
a section of downtown Frankfurt next to the river. You can see the river at the bottom of the slide uh, in front of the cathedral, which was you know, badly bombed out in the Second World War. Um, and in fact, Candela, Joseph, and Woods won first prize in this competition for this scheme, which was in effect a kind of two, well, it's a three-way grid because of course it's, it's rectilinear and you can see the, the rectilinearity of the grid, but it's also kind of uh, three stories high and they imagined it being elevated off the ground with a kind of um, service, uh, servicing level at grade um, and then pedestrian movement move, moving through it at the, the second and the third level. It wasn't, um, even though they won the competition, the scheme was not implemented and so the Frankfurt, the, the famous Frankfurt project never came to be. They did, however, manage to build a version of it in Berlin with Berlin Free University, uh, which you see here. And of course, here again, this is, this is a whole university laid out like a kind of gridded city um, uh, and uh, with where all the, all the program el programmatic elements of the university program are organized on, on, the, on the, this grid. Uh, so you can see big rooms for assembly, smaller rooms for seminars and offices, um, uh, uh, auditoria kind of inserted into it in various places, and then of course a whole series of, of um, courtyards as well. And uh, Berlin Free University is two stories high and is not, it's only slightly lifted off the ground. Um, but it's the most, um, it, it doesn't quite work, and there are interesting issues of, of, of scale that um, I don't have time to talk about in this presentation, although we could come to it in discussion if people wish. Um, but it is the most powerful example ever built of, um, of um, the new interest in the grid as a kind of metaphor of the city as it emerged in the, gen in the teeny tiny generation in the 1960s in Europe. Um, and of course, um, Shadrach Woods, one of the three partners in the firm, who was of course an American, um, uh, makes it clear in his own um, um, sort of memoir called The Man in the Street that his, the precedent he had in his mind for Berlin Free University was the Parisian Arcade, the 19th century Parisian Arcade, which of course takes us back to Baudelaire and Walter Benjamin. Um, uh, so here we have one of the typical Parisian arcades, which were the fascinating um, uh, precedent for uh, Woods and his partners in the, in the design for the Berlin Free University. Um, and in the, his remarkable study, comprehensive study of these, I'm not, I'm blanking on his first name, his family name is Geist. But the wonderful, the wonderful documentary book on the, the Parisian arcade, well, actually European arcade by Geist is an invaluable um, research document. Um, and it has these beautiful plan drawings showing the, um, the way in which the, um, the, um, the arcades are inserted into the pre-existing fabric of downtown Paris. Um, and of course, th this is, this is endlessly fascinating to me. You don't want to, if you're going to make an arcade, you don't want it to be a dead end. The whole point is not to have a dead end because, of course, the merchandisers, just like me, are looking for continuity. They want people to be able to keep on going. And so you can see here that the key, if you're a developer who's trying to kind of develop one of these arcades, you have to find pieces of property um, maybe more than one, probably more than one, in fact, so, to, so as to uh, get you frontage on two streets in sufficient proximity to one another that you can make a pedestrian connection through the parcels from the one street frontage to the next one. And that, of course, is well, exactly what happens here. In the, ca in the case on the right, it's the short dimension of the block. In the case on the left, here's boldness for you, it's the long dimension of the block. Um, but of course, it looks to my eye as though there was an available chunk of land in the middle of the block, which was quite large, which actually facilitated 
the, this intervention in the first place. Um, and then, of course, the other thing which is really fascinating in terms of the kind of, again, the primacy of continuity to identify here is look how closely these two come to being, to being aligned with one another uh, in relation to the street which separates them in the middle of the slide. So that you can, you can, not only can you get from one street to the other in either one of them, you can even get from one of them to the other one by crossing the street mid-block, taking your life in their hands, admittedly. But at least you don't, you don't have to make a long diagonal run across the street in order to do so. And then, of course, this is the most dramatic example that um, Geist includes in his book, where you can see here's a sequence which actually stretches across three blocks um, and even involves um, a multiplication of routes on account of the kind of availability of the large territory of, of land available in the, the southern. And of course, in, in this case, in the southern, well, not, sorry, not southern, it's not necessarily south, although Uvarnomaz, Zumomaz. I must be, it probably is the south one. In any event, you can see here the, 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 the system has got bold enough that he's actually not just doing an insertion in the middle of the block, but has actually taken over the frontage of the block as well, at least on the left-hand side. So, um, th as I say, one of, the, um, one of the most powerful indicators of the kind of um, authority of continuity as a kind of central phenomenon of publicness that I know. The, these are, um, well, I know, I, oh, sorry, yeah. This is, this is Geist's as assemblage of the whole group of them in the, um, the Layal precinct of Paris as they existed in their heyday. So you've got, got Garnier's Opera, where I started, off to his left here, and the, um, uh, well, where the, uh, where the, 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 the Baltar uh, sheds were used to be located here. And so this is the system of, um, of a gate in at its maximum extent in the middle of the 19th century. Um, we had an interesting, there's a precinct not far from where I live in Toronto, uh, which became a, a kind of sort of fashionable retail boutique precinct um, starting in the 1970s, um, and actually one of my professors at the university, oops, um, discovered just like the Parisian developers in the middle of the 19th century, my professor discovered that this, this street stopped here, but he discovered that you could buy two, piece, two parcels of land, one here and one here, block here to extend the pedestrian route that's already existed on the street here. So he, he did that, and he did a small retail development here, single sided because it wasn't wide enough to cover a chunk of retail. Um, and the thing went bankrupt. He was ahead of his time, um, and the, the retail market was not yet ready for his concept. But in later years, somebody from whoever got it from him in the bankruptcy auction did make money in subsequent years. So it's in, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not talking about retail marketing here. I'm talking about the authority of public space and of continuity as kind of one of its dimensions. But there's an interesting overlap of, uh, coincident overlap of interest between the two processes um, uh, at this point in my presentation. So, um, so that's, that's it. How am I doing for time? Summary of, uh, of uh, my oh, not bad of um, the architectural conditions of publicness: visibility, propinquity, continuity. Um, they're all fundamentally necessary in order for a space to feel public and for it to actually generate public praxis in the most uh, propitious way. Thank you.
So we're supposed to end by eight, so if there are any questions, we probably could take a few. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of interesting in this. Um, to start with, the, you set out the two poles of the idea of urban space, which is the, uh, the Creer Brothers, historical space, versus the, um, the sorkin Betsky opposite. Right. Um, somehow we didn't see so much of the sorkin Betsky end of the axis, but I'm interested that Google um, Sidewalk Collapse is coming to Toronto, and at least the public description of it is that they skew much more towards the historical um, type of space, that they have a fairly large development that they're um, working with in Toronto. Do you know anything about? I don't know. I actually know a lot about this because <laughs> I, I serve on the designer of the Atlantic for Waterfront Toronto, which is the um, redevelopment agency that gives sidewalks as a major deal. Um, so it's a kind of co-planning, co, co a, a, a proposal for a co-planning <laughs> success side between Waterfront Toronto on the one hand and sidewalk on the other. But um, I'm not sure I agree with your characterization of it. I, I, um, and by the way, this, this thing, this is causing great hoo-ha in Toronto at the moment. And it's partly, of course, because partly because of the Russian interference in the American elections and so forth. The um, Silicon Valley is on the defensive at the moment anyway because it's being shown up as not being an entirely benign um, communications entity which it has portrayed itself as being up until recently. And so there's a, a lot of kind of the spillover from that apprehension has actually led in Toronto to a, a fairly considerable degree of public wariness about what um, sidewalk might be up to, and particularly in respect of issues of privacy. Um, now, uh, the interest, uh, as far as I can tell, these apprehensions are, so far at least, largely displaced because n neither Waterfront Toronto nor Sidewalk has done anything yet. They're, they haven't even finalized their initial agreement as to what their sort of process um, of their working procedure for uh, you know, develop, uh, developing planning ideas together is going to be. Um, the other thing which is important to note about the, the Toronto project is that there is a development project on a, on a particular parcel of land um, that is largely already um, designed urban design, it's actually got a building, um, building envelopes, density discretion, and all of this is, has gone through city approvals. So there's not going to be any radical changes to uh, the configure, building configuration anticipated on this sequence of, small sequence of blocks on one portion of the land controlled by Waterfront Toronto, and on which Sidewalk is proposing to build itself headquarters. Um, the, the larger question has to do with an, a further territory of land, further to the south and to the east than this development parcel, um, which, as I say, it will obviously have be a smart building if they build it, but it's not going to be all that smart of leasing because too many decisions have already been taken for that to be able to be the case. It's in the, it's in the further territory to the south and to the east where the planning is much less uh, advanced at this stage, that the larger possibility of a more interfaceless urban form could occur because not, not as much is, is nailed down yet. Um, but that's a separate project for the headquarters thing. Um, and my friends at Waterfront Toronto tell me that that's the thing that Sidewalk is really interested in because they want to come up with a model which has applicability in other cities requires a bigger territory than is available on the parcel on which they would be building the land anyway. So um, so that is going to happen 
but it's still completely unresolved as to what the precise relationship between, well, what the methods Sidewalk will employ to do this review. There, I can tell you that it's not clear for me or for my friends at Waterfront Toronto, Sidewalk has no particular interest in personal detail. There will be a lot, there will be a lot of monitoring, in the proposition, there will be a lot of monitoring of building facades, movement in the street, traffic flow. They're very interested in autonomous vehicles, for example. They're curious to know whether the advent of autonomous vehicles will open the door to an alteration of our conventional standards for street sensors and so forth. So all those kinds of questions are in play, but they don't have much to do with the individual personal sexual preferences of the pedestrians on the sidewalk. Where they go on the sidewalk does interest them, but, so I, it's, A, it's early days yet, B, the apprehension seems to be largely anticipatory rather than, you know, well-founded, and C, that the jury still hasn't had this opinion from me. They haven't even finalized their deal. Hope that helps. Yes. If I may, I'm very impressed with your presentation, Professor. But I have to, this is a personal comment. Those views of Rockefeller Plaza, winter and summer, were taken from the window of the drafting room, and this is, this is personal experience, of the drafting room in the office of Harrison Abramovitz on the fifth floor, where I worked from age 20 in 1961 until age nearly 25 in 1965. But that's, that happens to be a personal experience. But what is, what I've, through five years of observation, what I found to be remarkable, and it's in support of your general overview, is that, and I was working at times, uh, I, was, I was the kid in the office who drafted very fast, and Harrison would call for me to give him you know, give me 19 elevation studies in two days and stuff like that. Uh, that was part of what, I don't know, made me the way I am perhaps. But through five years, the handling of the mass of pedestrians in that Rockefeller Center, and I witnessed it daily and I partook of it and, and that did not show the underground concourse, which ties it all together, including the rapid transit system. That, and now I came from, I was in New York. I had lived in the United States as a student, but I came from Havana, which is, maybe still is, I left in 1960, a very, a very lively pedestrian city you know, with an urban scale uh, that I can only allude to, but perhaps some of you have witnessed. But what I saw in New York, and I later lived in Paris, for instance, and I've been in your neighborhood in Toronto. What I saw in New York was remarkable. And what is also fascinating is the irony that Mr. Harrison and Rockefeller Center are sometimes looked down upon by some of us with different ideas, uh, purporting to provide uh, solutions to urban problems. I couldn't help but think a few blocks away of Ms. Van der Rohe's plaza in front of Seagram Building which complies with your dictum of let them see where they're going, etc. 
your observation, rather, forgive me, this whole thing, if I did not know what I lived through, I would have said, what an interesting lecture. But knowing, you know, and I, I'm guilty, knowing what I know, you know how impressed I am with what you've been telling us. And I think more of this, and I think I said that the other night to you and, and afterwards, we need to be more aware of this. We, uh, we're in Miami, which practically has no plazas. There's one by accident at Miami-Dade College. We are, uh, I'm not kidding. We are, we deserve more. But the handling of the mass, and in New York, it's really a mass of pedestrian population. There is amazing. And the points that you are making, that these spaces we design and make for the human activity that is not predictable, but can reach intense levels of interaction. Uh, I, I can only applaud you. I'm one hand busy with a microphone, but I can only applaud you. And I hope people don't think that I'm a hog for attention. I mean what I'm saying from the bottom of my heart. So I bow to you in the intelligence of your vision, and I thank you. This is, well, two questions actually, they're kind of back to back and related and they relate to the gentleman before me's comments as well. Um, and you allude to it several times throughout, first of all, this was very wonderful, thank you so much. You allude to scale several times throughout and I think one of the things that intrigues me particularly at the end is the, the comparison between the, the Paris Arcade, that small scale um, versus the, the Team 10 projects, these large scale or the Berlin University, the large scale. So that's my first question is just if you could talk a little bit about scale. And the other question was, do you see these um, three or four points? I had periphery down as a point as well, um, as being modes of analysis or as being uh, prescriptive ways to allow students and architects to begin to address public space or both. Does that make sense? So I think, yeah. Uh. Well, to, to deal with the second one first, I mean, uh, uh, probably, probably to some extent both are in this spot. Um, uh, I, I, let me confess that um, I've never been a methodologist. And indeed, I, I have to confess, I've always been kind of gun shy of so-called design methodology, which has, has always struck me as kind of dealing with the corpse after the patient has died. And, um, so, so I'm not, I'm certainly not pushing, and, and if in this respect, by the way, I can say that I, I, I fairly robustly disapprove of Christopher Alexander's various um, didactic projects, which it seems to me are um, not, um, not constructive. So for me, the, the fact that if my my writing oscillates between modes of analysis and prescription is probably too strong, but certainly it's, I wouldn't dispute that it's suggestive, it's very suggestive, um, but I'm, I'm happy for it not to sort of go beyond that. Um, but then to come to your, the, the first question, which I think is actually a more complicated one about scale, um, I, I, I mean, I probably, I, I haven't actually been as clear as I might have been about the Free University of Berlin, because it's true, the Free University of Berlin is a, the, the overall territory it covers is not small, that is true. But um, especially if you looked at the last of the Parisian examples I showed, it's not small either. Um, the, the irony about Berlin Free University is one of the things about it which doesn't work, in my opinion, is that the, 
the interior walkways are actually not big enough. They have the Parisian Arcade in the back of their mind, and so you're intended to read them as the analog of a historical European street. And that's clearly what Woodbridge's intention was, that they be read that way. They're not big enough to have that effect. And so what they seem to be instead is an institutional corridor. And that's, of course, a kind of sad drop in ambition from what he had in mind in the first instance. And I think it's partly that they're not wide enough, although the width is not the biggest issue. More critically, they need to be double height. The Parisian Arcades are always double height, at least, sometimes more than that. And then, of course, they're almost invariably, because they're early 19th century, they're almost invariably top-lit with skylights. And so the combination of the width, the double height, and the glazed roof means that they really do feel like a street, a pedestrian street, but they really feel like a street. And Berlin, with all its fundamentally important historical project, there's no doubt about that. And by the way, it's recently been beautifully restored by Foster and Partners, so it's really worth a trip to see now. But they didn't get the scale right, alas. But it's interesting that my criticism of Berlin should be that the scale is not big enough, because, of course, most of the time in contemporary architecture, the problem is the other way around, right? Maybe we might be out of time. Well, not well. If there's one more, we could probably take it. If not, we could. One question about the specimen project. I notice you've got several mausoleums and columbariums. Yes. These might be, in some view, be in the kitchen of the dead. Right, right. Is there any further planning on those issues? I think I would say no. I would say, I mean, there are some practitioners in the room. I know that, because that was me. And, of course, one of the things I'm sure all of us who are practitioners know is when you start out your practice, you really never know what the project you're going to be doing is going to be. And I can guarantee you that when I hung out my shingle as an architect, I didn't say, I'm looking for columbariums and mausolea to design. I didn't even know what one was at the time. I mean, we got the job to do the first columbarium because we had done a butterfly conservatory. And the guy who was running the cemetery organization had the idea that a conservatory might be an interesting model for a columbarium. And so he wanted a greenhouse designer to design a columbarium. And so that's what we did. And then they liked the columbarium. So then they then gave us permission to build three or four mausolea after that. But, of course, then this line of work dried up largely because mausolea are, after all, no longer environmentally politically correct. So there are a few diehard Portuguese and Italian Catholic Torontonians that still want to be in a mausoleum. But more and more people now are opting for both cremation or even more environmentally sophisticated techniques of disposal of the human body. And so anybody who's just starting out in practice, don't count on mausolea from here on in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.